am Chris Healy. I am an orthopedic surgeon and I specialize in hand and upper extremity surgery. So I would say about 80 to 85% of my practice is focused from the elbow to the fingertip. So that's where I tend to do most of my office visits and surgeries based on, on that region of the arm. So the goals of tonight are to learn about some common elbow conditions um, and just kind of get a little more sense of what the elbow joint does. Um, also learn about what your elbow pain may be and what you might be able to do about it. Some other things about when you should think about seeing a hand or upper extremity surgeon, such as myself, and then also uh, some time for question and answer session. All right, so what is causing my elbow to hurt? So that's a pretty common thought from, from patients. And, and really it all starts with the history. And this, the history is how your elbow came to start hurting. For example, was there a trauma or a fall? Did you slip? Did you land on your elbow? Did you twist it while you were working on your ho house or doing gardening or something? Um, the other question that is important to think about is at certain times of day, do you notice it more when you're doing an activity? Is it more at night? And then is it associated with certain activities? So, you know, one of the, or a couple of the topics that we'll be discussing tonight, will really focus on a couple of activities that hopefully a lot of you enjoy on a regular basis. So one of those is golf and the other is tennis. And we'll go through kind of both golfers and tennis elbows in quite a bit of detail um, and kind of hone in on, on what the symptoms usually are and what the treatment is. And then another thing is if there's something that makes the pain better or something that makes it worse. Is it a certain movement? Is it lifting a certain way? Is it um, you know, better if you ice it or if you use heat? All those things are helpful to tell me when you do come and see a hand surgeon in the office because it can really help kind of paint the picture of what's going on and allow me to more quickly uh, make a diagnosis and, and get to treating you. All right, so we're just going to go over some basic elbow anatomy because I think that'll help everyone understand kind of what the elbow does and what it's all about. So believe it or not, the elbow is actually made up of three different joints. And I'm going to use my mouse here, hopefully you can see. It's made up of three bones. So you have the humerus bone, the radius bone, and the ulna bone. And the humerus bone kind of articulates with both the radius and the ulna, and then the radius and the ulna also have an articulation. And articulation is where two bones kind of meet up together and, and move against each other. So those two joints between the humerus and the radius and the humerus and the ulna those are for bending and straightening your elbow, okay? So that's, that's when people think about what motion the elbow does, the main one is the bending and straightening. And so that's this region of the elbow there. The other motion that kind of is associated at the elbow is rotating your forearm. So that is when you're kind of holding your arm like this and you twist back and forth that motion, a lot of it is actually coming from your elbow. And it's this joint in particular, it's called the proximal radio ulnar joint. Um, that's a mouthful, you don't have to remember that, but that's a pretty important um, joint as well. And then just some of the main muscles around the elbow, I'm sure everyone has heard of the biceps muscle. That's one of the main muscles that bends your elbow. The other important thing about the bicep muscle is it actually helps turn your forearm. Another muscle that bends your elbow is called the brachialis. That's actually the more powerful elbow bender. The triceps muscle is the main muscle that straightens your elbow. And then you have muscles on the medial and the lateral side. The medial side is the inside of the elbow. The lateral side is the outside. The muscles on the medial side of the elbow mainly bend your wrist, 
and the muscles on the lateral side or the outside of your elbow mainly extend your wrist. So bending your wrist is going this direction, extending your wrist is going back this way. All right, so one of the common things that I may hear um, from a patient in the office is that they heard a loud pop in their elbow and they're quite concerned. Um, so the first thing I wanna know is where does it hurt? Can you point to where on the elbow it hurts the most? That helps me know where the problem may be coming from. Sometimes when you have a loud pop in your elbow, it is gonna be associated with some bruising and some changes in the muscles around your elbow. I also would like to know, how did you hurt your elbow? Were you trying to lift something? Were you trying to catch something from falling? And now that after you heard that pop, are there certain movements which are either painful or difficult or things you just flat out can't do anymore? Those are all important things. So these are a couple examples of just kind of the typical bruising that you may see if you have if you have an injury to the elbow. So when you have a pop in the elbow, the most common reason for that is that you may have injured your bicep tendon. Okay, there's the bicep tendon goes down and kind of across your elbow joint. And if you were lifting something heavy, it may have popped. A distal bicep rupture or tear is most common in males in their middle ages, so like 40 to 60 years old, but it can happen in patients who are younger and older. It all can also happen in females, it's just not as common. There are some risk factors involved. Smoking is a big one. Uh, previous steroid use is another big one. And the more common but um, not as well known one is just possibly some underlying chronic tendonitis of that tendon for a while. So it's not uncommon that I will have a patient come in and they have ruptured their bicep tendon. But when I dig a little deeper and ask them some more questions, they do tell me, you know, now that you say that, it kind of was sore on the front of my elbow for a while before, before I had this recent injury. So, you know, Smoking and anabolic steroids, those are risk factors. You can definitely tear your bicep if you are a non-smoker or never use steroids. Those are just things that increase your chance. And the main cause of a distal bicep tendon rupture is something called an eccentric extension force. So what that means is your arm is in a certain position and then it gets kind of tweaked in a certain direction. The most common way that this happens is something is falling and you're trying to catch it. So a common thing that I have from patients is something is falling out of their car that's heavy and they reach to grab it and they feel a pop or they're trying to lift something really heavy and they're really straining and then just the muscle gives out. That eccentric force is really strong and it will just tear the tendon off of the bone. So the most common reason though is, is that you're trying to catch something heavy and your arm is just in a bad position. A lot of times to really diagnose a distal bicep tendon rupture for sure, you do need to get an MRI. In patients who have thin arms, often you can feel the end of the tendon once it has ruptured and it's just kind of floating above the elbow joint. But more often they're swelling and bruising and actually feeling the end of that tendon becomes quite difficult. So in order to be sure that it is actually torn, I usually get an MRI of the elbow. All right, treatment. So if it is completely torn, you know, there's always a choice to do non-operative treatment. It will take some time, but with anti-inflammatories and Tylenol and progressive physical therapy, non-operative treatment is an option. However, you do have to go into it knowing that you're probably going to lose some strength with your bending of your elbow and 
supinating the form, which that is this motion to kind of turn your form like this. An operative is doing what's called a distal bicep tendon repair or reinsertion. And the way that I do that is, you know, after I find the torn end of the tendon, I put some really strong sutures into that tendon. And then those sutures get put through a metal button that actually go through the bone and help dunk the tendon into a little hole that I, that I drill. It's a really strong repair. It is something where you don't need a cast afterward. You don't need to uh, be immobilized for usually more than a couple weeks, um, but it is surgery. It's usually done through an incision. And this next photo is a little graphic, but it's usually done through an incision that's only about two inches long, um, kind of on the front of your elbow. So this picture is just during a surgery and it's just showing that this is the bicep tendon here and you can't see beneath it, but what will happen is we'll put some really strong sutures in there and then put it back and reattach it to the bone. Um, this surgery is performed on an outpatient basis. You come in, you go home the same day. Um, the surgery itself usually takes 45 minutes or an hour, so it's not a super long procedure. After surgery, you are in a splint just to kind of hold the elbow still for two weeks. And then I transition you into what's called a hinged elbow brace, which is this photo on, on the right side of the screen. And that elbow brace just gives you a little bit of stability, but it helps you to start moving that elbow and feel a little bit more comfortable. Because the whole point of doing these surgeries is to get you back, you know, being active and doing activities with that arm as soon as possible. That being said, I want you to move that elbow a lot but we have to protect the tendon repair for about eight to 10 weeks. And what that means is no lifting more than five pounds until, until that tendon is healed. So the job of, or my job doing the surgery is to put the tendon back in the correct position, but then it takes time for your body to heal it where it's supposed to be. And honestly, you know, this is a surgery that Sometimes I send patients to physical therapy for, sometimes I don't need to. It really depends on how well you're moving that elbow um, at that second post-operative visit. I expect there to be a little bit stiffness, but usually patients at about five or six weeks after surgery have gotten their full range of motion back. If that's not the case, that's when I like to send patients to therapy. And usually over time, you get your strength back and it's about a two or three month recovery overall. Okay, another common big pop in the elbow is from a distal tricep rupture. So just to review, the tricep is the muscle that straightens your elbow. And so you can also tear that tendon. Again, this happens most commonly in middle-aged males. It has a similar kind of risk factor profile as a distal bicep tendon rupture. Um, but a couple different ones is sometimes it's a little more common in patients who are doing weightlifting, especially competitive weightlifting. Um, and also if there's ever been a steroid injection given in that area. A steroid injection when used correctly and safely is, is pretty benign, as in like it usually doesn't cause any problems, but if there has been repeated steroid injections around a tendon, it can weaken the tendon to the point that just a, you know, otherwise benign movement um, could cause that tear. Um, the last one is, is use of a fluoroquinolone. That's not a medicine that's luckily used too commonly in the United States, so that's a pretty uncommon um, uh, risk factor. And then the last one is olecranon bursitis. And once we get to that topic, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's a risk factor for tricep tendon tears. So the treatment for this one is usually surgery. And the reason why is the tricep is the only muscle that straightens your, or one of the few muscles that straighten your elbow. The bicep muscle, you know, there's another muscle that we talked about, the brachial, or the brachialis, that is another big elbow bender. But for the tricep, it's a little bit more important. So it's one that I usually, unless there's a really strong reason 
that the patient shouldn't have surgery. It's something that usually needs to be fixed in a, in a timely manner. So here's just kind of a picture of what that looks like. This is if we're looking at the back of the elbow and you can see this blue star represents where that tricep tendon has torn. This is the tricep tendon and it's supposed to be kind of attached to the back of your elbow bone right here. And then here's an example of what it would look like on an MRI. So this is kind of a side view of the elbow. These are some of the bones. This is the humerus bone and the olecranon bone. And this black thing is the tricep tendon. And normally it should go all the way down to here and then insert on the tip of the olecranon. But you can see here, there's this big gap here filled with that white fluid, which is inflammatory fluid. So the technique for fixing a tricep tendon is very similar to the bicep tendon. Um, it involves putting some very strong sutures into the tricep tendon and then reattaching it down to the bone. And also the rehab is pretty similar too. Again, you're in a splint for about two weeks. And then from two to six weeks after surgery, you get one of those braces that I showed you earlier. And then after six weeks, you kind of gradually return to daily activities, but still being careful with, with not lifting too much weight. And with this one, we usually start strengthening that arm about three months after surgery. So this one takes a little bit longer to, to heal. Okay. So next one, this is, we'll, we'll try and spend a lot of time on this because I think this probably why a lot of you are here. Okay, it hurts when I play golf and tennis. Okay, guess what this is? Um, a lot of times patients will tell me that they can't, can't pick up their racket or they can't pick up anything. We're gonna talk about golfer elbow and tennis elbow and believe it or not, those will extend to things other than just golf and tennis. All right. Another common thing that people will tell me is they've tried ice, they've tried, you know, taking a week off of activities, um, they've tried taking anti-inflammatories and nothing seems to be helping. Um, and it's been going on for months. What can I do next? Um, and when you come to see me in the office, I really want to know where exactly it hurts the most because that'll help me tell, tell me which tendons may be involved. So um, there's a pretty common area that, that patients are going to localize pain in their elbow. Um, so this kind of, this picture gives it away. Tennis elbow tends to affect the muscles and tendons on the outside or the lateral aspect of the elbow. And this is also known as lateral epicondylitis. Okay, also known as tennis elbow. But like we talked about, you can get it from not playing tennis. And what it is, it's an overuse injury. And it's overuse of some of the muscles that are really important for gripping with your hand and then lifting objects up. So when you think about it, you know, that's a pretty common thing that we do every day, whether you're gripping a tennis racket or you're gripping something to lift it um, uh, with, your, um, with your arm. So it's pretty common. Um, it's the most common elbow condition that I see in the office. It's usually on the dominant side or the, the side um, that you use to write, um, just because it's natural for you to pick more things up with that arm. Um, and the, some of the risk factors are, you know, having poor technique when you swing the racket, a racket that's a little too heavy, a grip size that's a little too much, and then just the repetitiveness of it. So this is kind of, these are the muscles that are involved. The main one is the extensor carpi radialis brevis. That's a mouthful. I don't expect you to remember that, but that is one of the main muscles that bend your, your wrist back. So here's an MRI 
and you can see that there's a little tear there of the muscles kind of and tendons originating from that side of the elbow. Okay. I don't have to get an MRI super often for tennis elbow. Usually it's something that can be diagnosed clinically just by you telling me what's going on and me doing a physical exam. But if it has been going on for a long time and it has not responded well to some conservative treatment, we might talk about getting an MRI to get a clear picture of what's going on. So the mechanism for getting lateral epicondylitis is just repetitive wrist extension. So doing this motion over and over and over. The good news is that non-surgical treatment is typically very effective. This is not a common thing that I need to do surgery on, which is good. It usually responds very well to activity modification and anti-inflammatories. Okay, so we're just gonna move on to medial epicondylitis. This is also known as golfer's elbow, but same thing as tennis elbow. You can get golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis even if you're not playing golf. This one is an overuse of the muscles that bend your wrist down like this. It's less common than lateral epicondylitis, but still pretty darn common. And like I said, this is just from repetitive wrist flexion or wrist bending and also turning your arm a certain way. So this is a common injury in golfers, but also people who are doing a lot of pitching and throwing. So baseball players or, um, or track and field throwers. And this pain is going to be on the inside of the elbow. So you can see in this picture that the patient is kind of localizing the pain to that inside portion of their elbow. All right, so what can be done for lateral and medial epicondylitis? Like I said, the, the biggest thing is modifying your activities, okay? So that doesn't completely mean stopping playing tennis or stopping playing golf. What it means is making sure that we are, you know, strengthening those muscles really well and making sure that you have good form when you're doing those activities. Sometimes it does involve taking a little time though to rest and, and let, let things calm down. Um, there's something called a counter for, force brace, and that's also known as a tennis elbow brace. That's something that a lot of times patients have picked up um, from the pharmacy or the grocery store, even before they come to see me. That's the brace that kind of goes on, on this part of your arm. But usually what I actually recommend is a wrist brace. And the reason why is that wrist brace will kind of hold your wrist still, so you're not doing that repetitive bending or, or um, straightening of your wrist. The other thing that is important is doing some eccentric strengthening exercises. Those are some specific exercises that will really help strengthen those muscles, but not in a way that tends to be painful or make, um, make the symptoms worse. So, Typically, I give patients a instruction sheet with a lot of good exercises to do, and kind of this photo is representative of one of them. And it's just using a really light weight and just some very slow back and forth motions to strengthen those muscles. Um, acupuncture actually can be pretty helpful for this. Um, I am not an acupuncturist, so I'm not an expert. I'm going to go into how exactly it works, but I have had patients do it and it's been successful. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, at the physical or hand therapy office, they can do some iontophoresis or phonophoresis, which can be um, pretty helpful. And then the last thing is for medial epicondus, specifically in throwers, doing a throwing rehab program, which, um, really helps strengthen all the muscles kind of at the shoulder and shoulder girdle to make sure the throwing mechanics are good. That can be pretty helpful. All right. A pretty common question I get asked is, what about a steroid injection? Can I have a steroid injection for my, for my tennis or golfer's elbow? It used, to, historically, steroid injections were used quite a bit for, for, 
medial and lateral epicondylitis. However, more recent literature or research has shown that oftentimes a steroid injection, even though it may help for a month or two, it can make the condition worse over the long run. And the reason why is the steroid is a powerful anti-inflammatory, but it can also in inhibit some of the healing of that tendon. So a steroid injection, I usually try to not do a steroid injection for this just because the other things that I just went through tend to work better for a longer period of time. So a steroid injection, unless you're absolutely miserable and kind of willing to accept the risks, I tend to not do. Another common thing is something called PRP or platelet-rich plasma. This is a newer injection technique, okay? This is when we take blood from one of your veins and we use a centrifuge or a machine that spins your blood and it separates the blood into certain levels. And there's this platelet-rich plasma level that has a lot of good healing cells within it. And then those cells are re-injected into that area. The literature actually for using PRP for medial or lateral epicondylitis is pretty good. And that's, that's nice, it's a newer technique, it's non-surgical. The downside is that it has not yet been established as kind of the gold standard treatment for medial or, or lateral epicondylitis. And probably because of that, it is not something that insurance typically covers. So PRP, while it is pretty successful and can work well, there's a significant out-of-pocket expense associated with it. And that's something I just am upfront with my patient because I don't want um, anyone to get a surprise bill, but it's something that insurance generally doesn't cover, unfortunately. That being said, I think that PRP is something that we shouldn't go into unless we've really exhausted all of the other non-surgical treatment options um, that, I, that I talked about already. And then if as a last resort, um, surgery can be helpful for the really chronic medial or lateral epicondylitis. Um, like I just said, this is something I don't have to operate on very often. And I'm really not going to um, want to jump into surgery unless we've really tried all those other things first. So, and this unfortunately can last for nine to 12 months. So, but generally it, it doesn't last that long and you're better sooner with the kind of aforementioned treatment. Um, what operative treatment involves is basically making an incision over the side of your elbow and going and cleaning up all that kind of disease tendon tissue and then reattaching the tendon back down to the bone. All right, so here's a, here's a photo kind of illustrating that. And this is the bone here. And then there's a small anchor with some really strong suture attached to it that is then weaved through the tendon and holds the tendon in place while it heals. All right, if we ever do have to get to that surgical option, it's pretty similar rehab to, to kind of the bicep and tricep repairs. You're in a splint for a couple of weeks and then we get you moving and doing some gradual strengthening. Usually after about eight weeks, um, it's ready to, to strengthen as much as you want. All right, so moving on, this is another very common thing that I see. And um, some people will come on and they'll say, I have a golf ball on the back of my elbow. And this is often what it looks like. And it's a very big amount of swelling on the, on the back of the elbow that maybe just popped up out of nowhere. Maybe you had a little injury. So this is called olecranon bursitis kind of the, the bone on the tip of your elbow or the back of your elbow is called the olecranon. And over that olecranon, you have something called a bursa, which is a fluid filled sac. And bursitis is when you have inflammation of that fluid fans and fills up with more fluid. So here's just kind of a picture representing that 
So this is the bursa here on the back of the elbow. So some of the causes, often it's from a trauma to the elbow, like you fell on your elbow and you fell pretty bad, but not luckily not bad enough to break the bone, but it can just really inflame that bursa. But sometimes the trauma is pretty benign, like maybe you just bumped your, your elbow against a door or you know something hit it. Um, sometimes you can have what's called an olecranon bone spur, and that is a little kind of extra piece of bone on the tip of your olecranon. And that little tip of bone can irritate that bursa and cause it to become chronically inflamed. When we talked about olecranon bursitis being a risk factor for irritating your tricep or having a tricep tendon tear, it's that bone spur that can kind of just whittle away at the tendon and cause it to tear eventually. Um, the other thing that can cause olecranon bursitis is prolonged pressure on the back of your elbow. So you can get this from, you know, having a long road trip where you're resting your elbow on the armrest, or if you're working at a desk and you're resting your elbow um, in a certain position, that can also occur. A lot of times people think that it is infected and they say, is it infected, Dr. Healy? It almost certain, or it almost usually is not infected. It looks swollen, it can look red, but unless there's a reason for it to be infected, like you were recently sick or you had a wound in that area, it is usually not infected and it's just inflammatory fluid. So the treatment for olecranon bursitis luckily also is usually uh, non-surgical. Um, activity modification is important. That involves trying to avoid activities where you're doing a lot of bending of your elbow because that can further irritate the bursa. Um, I always recommend patients get an elbow pad. So this is an example of that. Um, it's something you can usually pick up at a sporting goods store or online. And it adds just a little bit of compression to that area, but also pads the back of your elbow so you're not constantly hitting it or bumping it on things. It allows that bursa to kind of calm down and be less inflamed. The other thing that can work well is doing a warm and moist compress. So, you know, I think that either heating up a warm washcloth in the microwave or using one of these, um, you know, where you put rice in a tube sock and put it in the microwave, that can work really well. That warm and moist heat kind of helps get that inflammatory fluid to to leach out a little bit. Sometimes when it's really bad or it has been going on for a long time and kind of the things I just talked about haven't worked very well, we may recommend putting you in a splint. And the reason why is when you bend your elbow a lot, you stretch that bursa and it can just continue to inflame it. So sometimes, and this isn't common, but I might recommend that we splint the elbow in a more straight position just to allow that bursa to calm down. Okay, so that would be an example of the splint. Wouldn't be something super cumbersome, but it would kind of keep your elbow straighter for a little while. The other thing that commonly I'll, I'll do in the office is I will aspirate the bursa, or in other words, I'll stick a needle into the bursa and suck the fluid out. Okay, so that's something that's easily done in the office. It's very safe. There's nothing uh, real scary on the back of the elbow that I need to watch out for. Um, but it is something that I don't recommend you do it at home. It really should be done by, uh, by either uh, a surgeon or a PA um, with experience with it. Um, and what the aspiration will do is it'll just shrink down the fluid and the bursa and just hopefully get it to kind of calm down a little faster. And um, it's, it's pretty easy to do. And then the last resort is doing surgery. Again, this is kind of like operating for golfer or tennis elbow. It's not something I have to do very often, but if you have one of those olecranon bone spurs, that's not gonna go away without um, surgically removing it. So unless there's an olecranon bone spur, I tend to not have to operate on this very often unless it's the sort of thing where we keep aspirating and aspirating and aspirating and the fluid just 
comes back after months and months. Okay, and that surgery is also as an outpatient, um, it's a pretty, pretty quick recovery. And I'll just kind of end, you know, something that we really don't have a lot of time for because they're really big topics in their own right are elbow arthritis and elbow fractures. Okay, so I see a lot of traumatic injuries to the elbow, um, a lot of broken, there's multiple places and bones that you can break in the elbow and they all have different ways that they're treated. So I think that's just a big topic that I don't know that we have uh, the time um, or interest in, in discussing. The other one is elbow arthritis. And the interesting thing with elbow arthritis is even if you have arthritis in the elbow, it is typically pretty well tolerated. As in, you may not know you have arthritis in your elbow unless I get an x-ray for some other reason like bursitis or you you know, maybe you just had a recent fall and your elbow is bruised and we're making sure you don't have a broken bone. But elbow arthritis is, it's different than hip and knee arthritis in that, you know, you don't walk on your hands. It's not a joint that is subject to a lot of weight bearing or loading. Therefore, like when you're, you know, if you have arthritis, it tends to not be super symptomatic. The exception would be if you have an x-ray, um, you know, that I've put on the left side of your screen, that's really bad arthritis in the elbow. You can see there's no joint space anymore, and that is completely bone on bone. And that x-ray is really more typical of um, the type of arthritis we would see in someone who has rheumatoid arthritis. All right, so thank you very much. I'm gonna open our little Q&A. Um, um, thing here and I'll just kind of go through a couple of them because it might be helpful if everyone um, uh, hears them. So the first one is asking about if I see a difference following three months of eccentric and isometric strengthening with tendon thickness. Um, short answer is no. Mostly I'm focusing on eccentric strengthening and I'm not measuring the tendon thickness. I mean, that's something you can do on an MRI or an ultrasound, but how clinically relevant it is to either that tendon healing or your symptoms going away um, is not something that we usually need to delve into. So that's, that's a good question, um, but those are both good strengthening techniques, but I do think that eccentric um, tends to be a little bit more successful. So I hope that answers that. All right, another question. I hurt my elbow from playing pickleball. Is there such a thing as pickleball elbow or is it the same as tennis elbow? Okay, that is a good question. Um, I am not an avid pickleball player. I think it depends on how you are holding your racket and which motion um, is causing your pain. You know, if it is the forehand, that's probably more of a golfer's elbow or a medial epicondylitis type thing. But if you have more pain when you're doing your backhand, that's more typical with tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis. So that's a good question. Um, Obviously, pickleball is really popular here in Bend and Central Oregon. So I do see patients who have kind of the symptoms we talked about earlier from pickleball. So um, yeah, that's just a good example of you can get tennis or golfer's elbow from either other sports or activities that are not golf or tennis. All right, another question. When doing a push-up exercise, a bench press or a push-up, I feel something, a nerve question mark, snap across the bone on the inside of my elbow if I get past 90 degrees. If done enough, it gets inflamed to where it's difficult to bend my elbow. Is there something to be done or just avoid bending my elbow? Um, this is a very good question and something that I really didn't talk about today. Um, whoever asked this question, very astute question, when you feel something roll across the inside of your elbow, and I'll try and show it on my camera here, but over on this side of the elbow, there is an important nerve on that side of the elbow. It's called the ulnar nerve. 
okay? That is a nerve that when you hit it, you get an electric shock type feeling that goes down your arm into your pinky. When you hit your funny bone, as a lot of us say, you're not actually hitting that bone, you're hitting that nerve. And that nerve is what gives you that really bad electric shock type pain. So sometimes it's not super common, but when you are bending your elbow, sometimes that nerve rolls over a corner of your elbow. And if it's happening a lot, and especially if you are getting nerve symptoms, and nerve symptoms tend to be shooting pain and numbness and tingling, that's something that definitely you should see a hand surgeon for. Because if that's happening often and it is um, irritating, it might be the case where we need to decompress that nerve and potentially move it to kind of the more the front of your elbow so it doesn't happen. So that's a really great question, something I didn't get in, um, in any detail with um, on today's talk. But yes, there are things to be done. And if you want to look it up, um, it's either called cubital tunnel syndrome or a snapping ulnar nerve. Um, so those are things you can just kind of Google and research on your own. But obviously, um, that's something I would definitely recommend seeing um, either myself or another hand surgeon about um, in uh, the not so distant future. All right. Okay, so um, uh, next question. Um, so this one is kind of asking about, um, you know, having a having chronic lateral epicondylitis or chronic elbow tendonitis, but having an MRI which didn't show any tears, okay? Um, so that is something that, that sometimes can happen, okay? Sometimes you can have inflammation or even some very small tearing of the tendon that is so small that an MRI won't pick it up. An MRI generally is good at picking up pretty big tears where the tendon has completely torn off of the bone. But sometimes with tennis elbow or golfer's elbow is there are micro tears within the tendon that are not gonna show up on the MRI. And sometimes it'll just show up as some inflammation on the MRI, or it may even look somewhat normal. Um, the other thing is, so, that, that can happen, um, and I am not surprised that maybe the other physicians you saw um, didn't recommend any surgical treatment because there wasn't anything, you know, that, um, uh, excuse me, that was torn that could be quote-unquote fixed, um, but that can, that can happen where, where you just have those micro tears and it does not get picked up on an MRI. Um, I think it's good that, that you tried physical therapy and steroids, um, but I think the other thing to consider doing is, um, is making sure you, you try wearing that, that wrist brace and, um, and probably getting evaluated again. Um, let me make sure I answered that question all the way. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's, that's something that, you know, probably following up on and maybe we might even need to get another MRI to see if it's, if it's gotten worse. But um, that's something that maybe a PRP would be, would be a good treatment for. So I hope that answered that. All right, another question. Do you see positive results from draining? I'm guessing that was about um, uh, draining an electron on bursa. That's a, this is a good, good question. I usually do see positive results. That being said, when I suck the fluid out, if it is still inflamed and still in that kind of acute inflammatory phase of the injury, um, the fluid can reaccumulate. It's not super common. And usually if you do the other adjunctive treatments, such as getting the elbow pad and doing the warm and moist compresses, it tends to, uh, to not reaccumulate as much, but it, it can. So that's something I always warn you that, you know, we're gonna do this, but it might come back. 
but it usually does not. So it's, it's pretty uncommon that I have someone come back in, you know, either a couple weeks or a month or two after they have their, their bursa drained with it uh, completely reaccumulated. All right. Um, can tennis elbow cause constriction in the fingers like trigger finger or weakness? No, usually not. Tennis elbow is a tendon condition kind of strictly at the elbow, but it can radiate pain down kind of the back of your, of your forearm. But it usually, it's a different tendon than the tendons that bend and straighten your fingers. Um, so it usually does not cause any tendon constriction. Um, it can cause weakness, and the weakness is really just from the pain that is associated with it. So weakness when you're gripping something really tightly or trying to lift it up, that's something that, um, that the tennis elbow weakness can be caused. And that's why doing those strengthening exercises can usually be pretty helpful. So I hope that answers that. All right, what are your thoughts on epicondylitis versus epicon? Dialgia, um, and is this an inflammatory process versus diagnosis tendon layering? Um, I think those are kind of in the same spectrum of tennis elbow or epicondylitis. I think that's getting into the weeds a little bit. Um, I think the epicondylitis is more from where the tendon is inserting onto the bone and the irritation at that site. The Second one is more just kind of where the, you might have those micro tears. The treatment is the same. Um, you know, we don't, we don't differentiate the treatment on, on one of those. And, and if we do do surgery, it's gonna involve debriding the epicondyle and removing that diseased um, layer of, of tendon. All right. So we got another question, should I consider a second MRI? That's kind of based on that earlier one that I was talking about. I think before you consider a second MRI, definitely seeing um, another hand surgeon, either the one you saw before or another one would, would be a good idea. All right, another question. I have a 35 year history of periodic elbow tendonitis, tendinosis, primarily medially from rock climbing. Um, it bothers you while sleeping and offers often your fingers will become numb at night. Yes. And any concerns? Yes, I do have concerns about that. That's kind of going back to where that nerve was flipping over one side of the elbow. So sometimes when you have bad medial epicondylitis or golfer's elbow on the inside of your elbow, that inflammation can spread to the ulnar nerve. And that ulnar nerve is the one that gives you sensation to your pinky finger and usually half of your ring finger. So that is something that definitely we wanna look into because if that nerve is getting irritated, what we don't want is for that numbness to become permanent or for you to lose strength in the, some of the small muscles in your hand that that nerve controls. So I do have some concerns, I think, you know, the periodic elbow tendonitis, that's not as concerning, but when the nerve becomes involved, that's when I think you need to see someone probably sooner than later and definitely do a good physical exam and maybe even a nerve test. And the nerve test is something where we test the, how well that nerve is sending an electric signal down the arm. And that kind of helps us hone in exactly where it's being pinched or irritated and also tells us the severity and kind of that helps guide our, our treatment process. But that's something that I definitely would recommend um, getting checked out sooner rather than later. Okay, well, I hope that answered everyone's questions. I'll kind of leave it open for another few seconds if anyone wants to submit any. Um, but once again, thanks a lot for joining me tonight. Um, I hope this was informative and you learned something. I think if you um, have any other questions, 
definitely feel free to come into the office and talk about it. Uh, the other nice thing is uh, this is being recorded. So if I went over something a little too fast and you want to go back, it should be posted on our YouTube page um, within the next few days and should be pretty easy to find. So with that, I'll close it out. And thanks again. And I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Take care now.